Hi, this is Laura Chapel, and welcome to the Packet Challenge Answers for SharkFest 2014. I'll just show you an example of how you might have gotten the correct answers. We'll begin with the very first packet challenge, which was called Trouble Ticket. This was contributed by Jasper Bongertz. The trace file we'll be working with is called troubleticket.pcapng. The five questions issued in this challenge are listed on the screen. So let's go take a look at the trace file and answer these five questions. If you haven't already printed out the packet challenge worksheets, go ahead and do that now so you can follow along and write down your answers. Over in Wireshark, I've opened up troubleticket.pcapng. And the first question is, what is the application protocol used? Well, if we look through here, just because we see that HTTP is listed where we have the destination port number, doesn't mean that it's necessarily HTTP in use. But if we look a little bit further, we can see an HTTP GET request. So the application protocol used is HTTP. Question number two asks, are all the GET requests asking for the same URI? Well, let's put up a filter, a simple filter saying HTTP contains, quote, GET, all in capital letters. Applying this to the trace file, I can see the three GET requests. There are other ways that you can get these listed out as well. Because we have two of them that contain a TCP retransmission, they don't line up very nicely here, so I can't compare them very quickly. One option would be to simply make a new column based on the URI value. So in one of these packets, I'm going to select the Request URI line, right mouse click, and choose Apply as Column. I'm going to resize my columns, and now it's very easy to see in my new Request URI column that all of the GET requests are looking for the same item. I'll clear my filter and right mouse click on my new column and remove it at this time. Question number three stumped a lot of people. Based on where this trace was taken, do the packets get lost closer to the client or closer to the server? In this trace file, our client is 46.115.18.210 and the server is 81.209.179.133. So let's go to the top of the trace and take a look at what's happening. Now Wireshark is capturing inside the infrastructure. And from where Wireshark is capturing, Wireshark sees the SYN packet go past from the client towards the server. Then Wireshark sees the SYNAC come back from the server going in the direction towards the client. There's no ACK that occurs to finish up the three-way handshake though. Instead, we see the server sending another SYNAC towards the client and another SYNAC towards the client. we see a similar pattern occur again, where we see a SYN packet, and then we see the SYNAC and the SYNAC, but we don't see the ACK packet from the client. So from where we are sitting, packet loss has already occurred in the direction of the client. So packet loss is occurring closer to the client. The next question that came up is, this trace file was taken inside the infrastructure. What is the initial round trip time of the connection? This also caught a lot of people. Now notice that it says that this trace file was taken inside the infrastructure. And if you've watched any of Jasper's presentations, he has a great little trick for getting the round trip time when you're capturing packets inside the infrastructure as opposed to capturing at the client or at the server. Now here in this example, we have Wireshark capturing inside of the infrastructure. So let's say we're capturing traffic between client B and a server over here. It doesn't matter what the infrastructure devices are. So I'll remove those from our view. Now from where Wireshark is capturing, we would see the SYN packet go across the network and the SYNAC coming back and the ACK to finish the three-way handshake. We have to capture the entire three-way handshake in order to measure the round trip time 
when we're capturing inside the infrastructure. What we will be measuring is the time from the first SYN packet that we see to the ACK packet. We'll be measuring the time from the point of the SYN packet to the ACK packet. Packet number one of the TCP three-way handshake to packet number three of the TCP three-way handshake. So now let's go back over to Wireshark and find a complete three-way handshake and perform this measurement. So looking at this trace file, we have a lot of incomplete three-way handshakes until we get down to packet number eight. In packet number eight, we see a SYN, followed by a SYNAC, followed by an ACK. So we want to measure the time between packet eight and packet 10, the first and the third packet of the three-way handshake. We can do this by simply right mouse clicking on packet number eight and setting a time reference. Or we could add up the time that we see in the columns to figure out what the value should be. We can see that the round trip time is 3.562215 seconds. The last question posed in this challenge was, who owns the server? Well, let's take a look at the name of the server. In HTTP communications, when a client makes a request of a server, it will include a field called the host field. There's the host field value. And rather than trying to type that value out again, I'm going to simply select that line, right mouse click, and choose copy the value. I'm using domain tools, but you can use any sort of a domain lookup tool. I'm going to paste in the value that I had in that field, and I'll get rid of the www at the beginning. I'll do a search, and Domain Tools indicates who owns this server. This server is owned by Synergy Systems and Jasper Bongertz. So now we've completed packet challenge number one, trouble ticket. Let's move on to packet challenge two, big FTP. Packet challenge number two, big FTP. The trace file we'll be working with is also called big FTP. PCAPNG. Here are the five questions posed by this packet challenge. Again, if you haven't downloaded the packet challenge worksheet, you may want to do that at this time. Let's go jump into the trace file and start working on these questions. The first question asks, on which host was Wireshark running when this trace file was taken? Well, one easy way to determine this would be to change the time column value so that it shows us from the end of one packet to the end of the next packet. I'll select View, Time Display Format, and Second Since Previous Captured Packet. Now we can see a request going out from an FTP client and a response coming back about 36 milliseconds later. Almost immediately, we see that the client sends another request out. It appears that we're sitting on the client system. That time is so fast, we must be sitting directly on that client. Question number two asked, if this network does not support jumbo frames, why do we see 16,450 byte packets in this trace file? Let's sort the length column. I'll click on the length column twice and jump to the top of the list. There we can see our packets that contain 16,450 bytes. Let's go out to the slides for a moment and I'm going to be introducing you to TCP segmentation offload. TCP segmentation offload is often referred to also as large segment offload. Now there's something called large receive offload, but that's not what we're seeing in this trace file. We're seeing packets that are going outbound from our client, and they appear to have this huge number of bytes in the packets. We know that these packets cannot go out onto an Ethernet network that size, and we know jumbo frames are not in use. 
So this is what is happening. On the host where we're taking the trace file, that host supports large segment offload. When an application sends data bytes down to the TCP stack, the TCP stack that would normally segment those bytes doesn't do that. In this case, that responsibility is offloaded to the network interface card. So TCP places a header at the beginning of this information and passes this information down to the IPv4 header. The large packet comes down and this is the point on that Windows host where Wireshark gets a copy of the packet. So we get a copy of the packet before the packet goes down to the network interface card driver. The driver passes the 16,450 bytes down to the network interface card and it's the network interface card that will actually create the TCP segments and send them out onto the network. If we were to place Wireshark out on the network, perhaps using a network tap or spanning a switch port somewhere along the path, we would see seven different packets, not just one as we see in our trace file. So this technology is called TCP segmentation offload and large segment offload would have been accepted as an answer. The next question asked, what data packet is being acknowledged in frames 314 to 321? So let's jump directly to frame 314. I have to remember to resort my trace file based on the number column heading. In frame number 314, we can see that the acknowledgement number field says, I expect to see 542121 next. Well, let's add some columns here so that we can see the sequence, next sequence, and acknowledgement number value. I'm going to hide the protocol column for the moment, and I'm also going to hide the length column for just a moment. Inside of any one of these packets, I'll expand the TCP header, and I will right mouse click on the sequence number field and apply this as a column. I will select and right mouse click on the acknowledgement number field and apply this as a column. And I have to choose a data packet in order to get the next sequence number value up as a column. Next sequence number is a Wireshark interpretation. That field does not exist in a TCP header. I'll right mouse click on the next sequence number field and apply this as a column as well. These headings are pretty long, so I think I'll shorten them by right mouse clicking on the column headings and choosing Edit Column Detail and changing the sequence number column to just SEQ pound sign. I'll go to the Acknowledgement Number Field column and edit that and just simply call it AC pound. And finally, I'll right mouse click on the next sequence number column and change it to Next SEQ pound. I'm going to click and drag my next SEQ column over to the left so I have them in the order of sequence number, next sequence number, and acknowledgement number. I'm also going to change the alignment so all alignment is left on these three columns. Now I want to know what data packet is acknowledged in frames 314 through 321. Well, if we look at these, we can see the number counting up, and at the end of this set, it says, I believe the next data packet will be 557057. That will be the sequence number. If we look up in the trace file, we can see this data packet indicates that the next sequence number would be 557057. Data packet number 304 is being acknowledged by all of these ACK packets. Remember, this packet is too large to go out onto the network as it is, so it's going to be segmented. A lot of packets will go out on the wire, and here are all the ACKs for the packets on the network. The next question asks, why can't you view the reassembled JPEG file that is uploaded in this trace file? Well, we're in the FTP data section, so let's just see 
what the data actually is. I'll right mouse click and follow the TCP stream. And immediately we can see that we have a file identifier of MZ. That indicates it's a Windows executable. And we see the notation that this program must be run under Win32. So this is actually a Windows executable program. It is not a JPEG image. I'll select Save As and simply save this to my directory. I'm going to call it not a jpeg.exe. The last question asks, what is the true purpose of kidsatbeach.jpg? Well, we know it's not an actual graphic file. We know it's an executable. And a lot of you were not brave enough to go ahead and execute that file to see what it is. Some of you did, however. For those of you who did, you received a message that this was the installation process for the OJOSoft audio converter. So that's what it was. It was not a malicious file. It was actually just the installer for an audio conversion tool. Now let's go over to Paid to Play. Paid to Play uses the trace file called allplaynowork.pcapng. The five questions issued in this challenge are listed on the screen. I've opened up this trace file. I don't need the sequence, next sequence, and acknowledgement number columns, so I'm going to right mouse click on those column headers and just simply hide those columns at this time. The first question in this challenge asks, for what server did the client try to resolve an IPv6 address? The IPv6 address resolution process looks for the value AAAA in the DNS query type. So if we expand one of these packets and select the type field, we could right mouse click and prepare a filter based on the value but we'd have to translate this over to the number used by AAAA. What if we just type in AAAA here? Notice that Wireshark understands that syntax and it brings up all the DNS queries for AAAA records, which would be looking for an IPv6 address. All of the DNS queries for IPv6 addresses are trying to resolve WS12 gti.macfee.com. Question 2 asks, what operating system do you think the client is running? I'll clear out this filter, and if we have some get requests in there, which we do, I'm going to look at the user agent field to see if that can somehow tell us what type of a client it is making these requests. There's the user agent line in frame number 37. It says XBLWIN 2.0. So that's the software that's making the request here. I'll right mouse click and simply apply this as a column. And when we sort this column, we can see that this all shows up as GL Web Tools or XBLWIN 2.0. A lot of people chose that the operating system was Xbox Live. Well, this is our client, and our client is definitely not an Xbox Live operating system. But if you look to the right on any of these GET requests, watch for an indication that the client is a Windows 8 client. We can see it when the client requests its configuration information. It asks specifically, for Windows 8 configuration details. I'll sort again by the number column. The next question is, what is the color of the mermaid's hair? In fact, the next three questions can be answered using HTTP object reassembly. In Wireshark, I'll select File, Export Objects, HTTP. 
Here are the list of the files that have been downloaded. And I can see there's one referencing Little Mermaid. So if you have kids that are five years old or younger, you probably already know that the Little Mermaid's hair is red. But if you don't have kids that are that age, you could choose to save all and simply provide a name. Downloaded images. Now I'm going to go to that directory and take a look at the different files that have been saved. Notice that Wireshark created a folder for me called Downloaded Images. And in this directory, I can see there's the little mermaid image. And she has red hair. The next question was, what classic games did the user learn about? Name all of them. Well, this is the file classicgames.pcapng. So we can examine this file a little more closely. And I'll actually double click so I can enhance it. Classic games are Microsoft Solitaire, Pac-Man, Mahjong, Big Buck Hunter Adventure, Pinball FX2, and Bejeweled. The last question was, which Angry Birds edition did the user learn about? Looking through the images again, we can see an Angry Birds edition, and we don't even have to enlarge the graphic. We can simply look at the name of this file, and we can see it's Angry Birds in Space. Now it's time to move over to the next challenge, which is Browsing Buddy. In this challenge, we'll be using the trace file called browsingalong.pcapng. The five questions issued in this challenge are listed on the screen. I've opened up browsingalong.pcapng, and I'm going to remove the user agent column. I don't need that at this time. The first question asks, what version of dump cap was used to capture this trace file? That can be found under statistics and summary. Taking a look at the summary information, we can see that it's dump cap version 1.10.7. The next question caught a lot of people, and this has to do with one of the Wireshark default settings. The question was, which frame contains the 200 OK response to the get request for forward slash scripts forward slash ac underscore oe tags dot js? So let's simply find that get request. I'll just do this a lazy way, looking for forward slash scripts, forward slash ac underscore oetags dot js. There's the get request. It's frame number 220. Now I'll simply right mouse click and uh, let's do a conversation filter. So we're just looking at that specific conversation. Here we can see the get request and we want to know which packet contains the OK response. Now here's where Wireshark settings can throw you off. If we look inside of that HTTP get request in frame number 220, and we look in the HTTP section, it tells us the response is in frame 271. If we double click that hyperlink and go to frame 271, notice that if we look down here in the packet bytes pane, this packet does not appear to actually have a 200 OK in it. But the packet details pane indicates that it does, and so does the packet list pane. And that's because by default, Wireshark uses TCP reassembly. That's when we see all these TCP segment of a reassembled PDU or protocol data unit. Wireshark is placing the 200 OK indication on the last packet required to download the particular object. That's not where the actual 200 OK resides. So in this frame, I'm going to jump back to the request, frame 220 and I'm going to change the TCP setting. Selecting the TCP header in the packet details pane, I'm going to right mouse click 
and go to Protocol Preferences. And I'm going to turn off Allow Subdissector to Reassemble TCP Streams. Now I'm looking at frame number 220 in the packet list pane and notice that I can see that frame number 266 is a 200 OK. Looking inside the HTTP section, we can see that it indicates the response is in frame 266. So that would be the correct answer. The next question asks, in what kind of bar is the client interested in? We can use a lazy filter for this one, frame contains bar, but what if the word bar is in initial uppercase? In that case, we could use regular expressions by saying frame matches, parentheses, question mark, lowercase i, and parentheses, and then typing in bar. The moment we use matches, we're telling Wireshark we want to use regular expressions and Wireshark uses Perl compatible regular expressions or PCRE. I'll click apply and see if I can find some frames that talk about the bar. Notice that we have a lot of different packets in here that just have continuation of information but we can also see a little bit further we start seeing a lot of references to a tiki bar. So that's the type of bar that they are interested in. The next question is, which TCP stream experienced the most retransmissions? Let's start by clearing out our filter and adding a column to show us the TCP stream number. I'll expand the TCP header in the packet details window, select the stream index field, right mouse click and apply this as a column. Now we have our stream index number. We want to see which stream has the most retransmissions, so we're going to put in a filter. tcp.analysis.retransmission. We'll apply the filter, and now we can see the different streams and the retransmissions of each stream. We can sort on the stream index column heading so that we can group together like numbers. So I'll sort my stream index from low to high, and looking through here, it appears that stream number 129 has the most retransmissions, although stream 141 is pretty close. But the answer is stream 129. The next question caught a lot of people as well. Question number five states, frame 8500 is a retransmission triggered by duplicate acts. Why isn't it marked as a fast retransmission? I'll clear out my filter and I'll jump to frame number 8500. There's frame 8500 and we can see, yes, it's marked as a TCP retransmission. Let's see what the sequence number is of that frame. I'll display my sequence number column. Frame 8500 is sequence number 74441. Let's go ahead and bring up our acknowledgement column. Let's add one more column. Let's bring back our next sequence number column. Now we can see what happened in this trace file. We can see that frame number 8456 is marked as previous segment not captured. So let's go to the previous packet from this host. The last packet sent from this host, whose IP address begins with 216, indicated that the next sequence number should be 74441. We see that it does not send that packet number, it jumps up to 77361. We see do pack one, do pack two, and then we have the retransmission. But shouldn't this be a fast retransmission? It is a retransmission corresponding with the requested packet based on the duplicate acknowledgements. So let's go out to the TCP code in Wireshark and take a look at why this might not be defined 
as a TCP fast retransmission. I'm out on Wireshark.org and under develop I'm going to choose to browse the code. On the left hand side I'm going to jump into the ePAN directory. In the ePAN directory I'm looking for the dissectors subdirectory and there it is. And now I'm looking for a file called packet-tcp.c. There's the code for TCP and that contains the expert information in it. I'll select that file and I'm looking specifically for retransmissions. So I'll do a find operation until I find the section that talks about retransmissions and tells us what Wireshark defines as a retransmission versus a fast retransmission. Here we go. In this version that I'm looking at, this information is contained starting on line 1167. So if it contains data, or is a SIN or a FIN, and it doesn't advance the sequence number, it must be one of these three. So we're trying to find out why isn't it marked a fast retransmission? Why did Wireshark just mark it as a retransmission? And here's the reason. If there were greater than or equal to two duplicate acts in the reverse direction, which we did see in the trace file, and if this sequence number matches those acts, that's correct, they're all asking for that packet number. And if this packet occurs within 20 milliseconds of the last duplicate act, then it's a fast retransmission. Let's go back and look at the timing. So we want to see how much time transpired between the last duplicate act and this one. And one of the ways that we can do this is we can add our TCP delta column. This is a column everybody should have whenever they're analyzing TCP-based communications. To add this column, I'll go to the TCP section in the Detail window, right mouse click, and go to Protocol Preferences, and we want to make sure Calculate Conversation Timestamps is enabled. In the current version of Wireshark, it's off by default. I've already enabled it on my system. In the bottom of the TCP header, I'll expand the timestamps section, and here we can see time since previous frame in this TCP stream. I'll right mouse click and apply this as a column. I'm going to change the name, simply call it TCP Delta. And now we can see that our packet number 8500 when we look at just the stream, now notice I'm only interested in stream number 48. I'm not even applying a filter for that stream, but I can tell that the previous packet in the stream, the duplicate act, was 25 milliseconds earlier. If this packet had arrived within the 20 milliseconds, it would have been marked as a fast retransmission, which is what it actually is. Now let's go over to the last packet challenge, which is called simply OUCH. Now we'll be working with a trace file called asksnopes.pcapng. The five questions issued in this challenge are listed on the screen. I'm going to start by hiding some of the columns that I don't need right now. And the first question is, what web server software is used by www.snopes.com? Well, now I want an HTTP host column. So if I go to any of the GET requests and expand the HTTP section, there's the host field. I'll right mouse click and apply this as a column. We can see that a client is going out to www.snopes.com in frame number 19. And the IP address of the Snopes server is 66.165.133.65. To find out what web server software that server is using, we can simply follow the TCP stream 
on any communication going to that server. In the HTTP response packet, we can see that the server indicates it's running Microsoft IIS 5.0. The next question asks, about what cell phone problem is the client concerned? So let's just simply put out a filter that's a very broad filter. Frame contains, quote, cell. Again, if we're not sure if we're looking for upper or lower case, then we may want to use matches and use the open parenthesis, question mark I, close parenthesis, to indicate upper or lower case. There, it should be a lower case I. And I'll apply this. So looking on the right hand side, I'm looking for any reference to cell. I could also add I'm looking for phone. But as we look through here, we can see that when the client is talking to Google Analytics, there's a reference to Snopes. And if we scroll to the right hand side, way over here, you'll see, ah, cell, phone, and lucky we did case insensitive here. Cell, phone, recharging, electrocution. The next question asks, according to Zillow, what instrument will Ryan learn to play? Well, to find this information out, we need to find a packet that has something to do with Zillow. So frame matches, question mark, I, Zillow. There we can see a get request. Somebody is requesting a video from Zillow. Now's the time we might want to do some HTTP reassembly. First, I have to make sure that reassembly is enabled in Wireshark. So in the TCP section, I'll right mouse click, go to protocol preferences, and allow the subdisector to reassemble TCP streams. This must be on if you're going to do reassembly of objects. Now I'll select File, Export Objects, HTTP, and in this list there will be a reference somewhere to Zillow. I'll go ahead and save all of the items. Zillow Search, I'll give it the name of Zillow Search, and Wireshark will place all, of, place all of these in that directory. Notice that it says some files could not be saved, but that's okay. Let's see what we did get. There's our directory, and there are our objects. And we're looking for a reference to Zillow. There's our Zillow. And we'll go ahead and just simply double click on that. Where Ryan will learn to play the saxophone. So that is our answer to the third question. The next one asks, how many web servers are running Apache? Well, we know where the servers identify their uh, information is in the response packets. So let's go to the server response packets. So in Wireshark, I'm looking for any packet that has a response. And one way we can do this is by putting in a filter for HTTP.response. That will show us all of the HTTP responses. I'm going to hide my host column. And this time I'm going to put in the server column. So I'll right mouse click and apply this as a column. And let me align the columns again. The question is, how many web servers are running Apache? Now, looking through here, we can see a lot of Microsoft, but we have some Apache. So we're looking in that field, and let's find that field, specifically for the word Apache occurring. So I'll expand this out, and instead of doing HTTP response, we're looking for HTTP.server. I'm going to right mouse click and just simply prepare a filter based on this value. I'm not going to say HTTP.server equals Apache, I'm going to say it contains Apache, and I'll apply this. Now I want to know how many servers use Apache. I'll go up to Statistics and Endpoints. And in my Endpoints window, I'll click on TCP. 
and I'm going to limit this to my display filter. Oops, actually I want to have IPv4 in there. Sorry, I clicked on TCP. I'm looking for IPv4. Now a lot of people got caught by this line right here. This is the client. This is not the server. The client is not running Apache. So even though the number says 22, you'd have to subtract one to get down to 21. There are 21 servers running Apache. The last question is what host Please provide the IP addresses. Think the jokes are more entertaining when they are explained. So let's cast a wide net here and just simply say frame contains joke. And we can see right away jokes are better explained comes up. And if we look at the hosts that are sending this message by sorting the server column, we can see these messages come from 173.241.244.153.99.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.